might doze off for a while.
glad that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Um, as we gather, would you like to remind our hearts and our minds of a couple things? The first being that, that this morning we haven't come um, to church, right? We have come as the church. The church isn't a building, it's not a location, it's not a place, it's a people. It's a people who are following and trusting and treasuring after Jesus. And so we have gathered as a church, um, we've gathered as a family, and that means that here in a little bit when the service is over, that the church will get up and go back out into the world. Um, into a world that's in desperate need of, of joy, of peace, of hope, um, of love, uh, of just being seen and, and belonging. We know that those things are found in Jesus, in the person, the work, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. So we, we get to go out and, and be that. So this morning, we want everything that we do, from the songs that we sing, uh, from the scriptures it's preached, as it's, as it's prayed, as it's read, in our conversations, to, to center our hearts, to, to lift our chins, to see more of Jesus, that he is sufficient, that he is enough, I and mean, that he's all that we need. And so we want to celebrate that this morning. Um, so this morning is actually the, the one-year anniversary as well as Redeemer Border, and so it's hard to believe, but their first service was a year ago um, today. And so they're, they're celebrating with, with breakfast this morning, and we just want to be mindful of continuing to pray for Ricky and Callie, the Garzones, and their church um, as they um, just walk out in the light of the gospel in order in the surrounding area as well. So we just want to celebrate with them. And so let me, let me pray for us, and then we'll enter a time of worship through song. Um, if you have a little one with you um, prior to the sermon, uh, kids kindergarten and down, we'll head down this hallway here. Um, and our elementary kids have class. Uh, this morning, is that? Yes. That's right, yes. Um, somebody's shaking their head, but they weren't looking at me. Um, and so the first through fifth graders uh, will meet by the front door um, as, after the second song before the sermon. So hey, let me, let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father, we, we come this morning grateful for your faithfulness. Lord, thankful that your mercy is new every morning. So, Lord, we want to celebrate today that, that uh, Redeemer Order is, is celebrating a year. Lord, that you have been gracious and faithful and sufficient for them. I'm um, to see something that has come from nothing become something. Um, Lord, so would you continue to allow that to be a place where the gospel is proclaimed, where marriages are healed, where uh, addictions are broken, where, where sin is let go of, and where your name is trusted Father, we pray that for ourselves here, that we would be that place. Father, we, we know that so many um, of our friends, our neighbors, our, our family, our loved ones um, are just sick right now. Um, and so, Lord, we, we're grateful for your sustaining grace that, that whether today we feel strong and, and alive and well, or whether our bodies feel broken and beat down, or that you are um, sufficient, that you are enough. You have not left us, you have not forsaken us. Father, that you see us and that you are constantly working on our good. And so, Lord, for those who, who are just tired and weary this morning, would you sustain them? Would, would your presence uh, be real to them? And Father, would you give us eyes to see uh, how we can be your hands and feet, how we can serve, how we can honor you in all of our life? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stand with us. Let's sing together this morning.
the world and all who live in it. For you established it upon the seas and founded it upon the waters. Uh, Psalm 139 tells us that before we were born, before we even took a breath, um, before we were even a thought in our mother's and father's hearts, uh, you knew us, that you formed us and you knit us together with purpose and with faithfulness and with love. Um, your word also tells us in Genesis that you created us in your image. Um, and it tells us that, that we're created to reflect your glory. Um, God, and, and in Romans, you tell us that, that you're working and sustaining everything on earth and that each of those things is for your glory and for the good of your people, for those that you've called according to your purpose. So would you awaken our hearts this morning just to see you um, as creator and sustainer of our lives and our souls um, and the lives and souls of those around us? Um, would you awaken us to the needs um, of the people around us and help us, God, to be instruments of your reconciliation? Uh, would you draw your people in today? Would you um, call us to, uh, to listen carefully to your word? Um, would you speak truth by your spirit into our hearts that we might be formed and shaped into the image of Jesus Christ, your son? And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Our littlest people are dismissed down this way for child care. And our big kids, uh, first through fifth grade, do have a class across the street. And they'll need a TV by the front door uh, to head that way. Right? If there's a morning where you have nothing planned, right? You get up in the morning 
and, and it doesn't go the way that you want it to go. Right? And then a morning where you're busy, everyone wants to sit in their pajamas and stay. Right? Like that it feels like you can never really grasp the thing that you're that you're looking for. And when, whether you want noise, you want quiet. Um, that you'll see young parents say they'll start to long for the day where the kids are gone, right? In a, in a hard season. And then if you meet a parent who's empty nesters, they're like, I just wish my kids were back under our roof. Right? That it feels like we can almost always be looking for what we don't have. And we know that when you have young kids, it, the days can feel long, and yet the time is moving rapidly. And so if we're going to be as healthy as we can in parenting, we know that we have to lift our, our face out of the grind and look up to a day that's coming. Right? That we're, we're actually raising children to the day that they'll leave. Like that is, that is the biblical mandate is that we're shooting them out into the world. And so if we're, if we're parenting towards that end, it allows us right, to get out of the, the muck and the mire of the daily grind and bring intentionality into it. And yet, because of life, we continually kind of look down and occasionally when we wake up, we're like, oh yeah, they're going to leave. So I need to parent in, in light of that now, even if it's years and years away. And so this morning, what, what the author of Ecclesiastes is going to do is he's going to try to give us um, an eye to a day, right? A day that's coming for all of us that will change the way that we live today. It'll, it'll bring us out of just kind of the, the grind of life and make us question and ask some things. And so if you look at verse 12 of chapter 6, we're gonna, there's a rhetorical question that then kind of leads into chapter 7. He says this, For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life? Right? He sounds like, a, like a, just a, an angry philosopher here. Which passes like a shadow. For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Right? So he just says, listen, what good is it? You have a few days. It's vain. You're going to pass like a shadow. Like he's not like painting a rosy picture of life. He's like, what, do, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? And so what he's doing is he's saying, listen, what are we supposed to spend our life on? And what happens after death? And he's kind of leaving these questions. And then this chapter ends. And, and if you've dealt with wisdom or poetry, right? Like this is a... A technique to make you kind of have some thoughts in your heart or in your mind that you would ponder and consider and question. Some of you um, do this naturally, you do this well. As a culture, we don't embrace this, right? There's too much um, noise. There's too much music. There's too much um, podcast. There's too much TV. There's too much busyness. There's too much activity for us to really sit and to ponder. Like, there's probably, if you look at your week this week, you probably didn't go, well, I had a good two hours of pondering. <laughs> right? like that's, that's not, pondering is not a part of our week typically, because we're doing the next thing. We're, we're a little bit afraid of the quiet. Right? We're, we're not sure where our brain, our brain or our heart will go. And so we, we avoid it. And we intake instead of sitting in it. So let's pick up now chapter 7 and we'll begin these rhetorical questions of what is it that we're supposed to do? Our life passes like a shadow. What comes after? And he continues. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay its heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the, glad, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and advantage to those who see the sun. 
For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. I'll we'll stop there for the moment. So he asks these rhetorical questions, and then he leads into kind of this poetic, uh, proverbial, just list of sayings. And he's utilizing death to gain your attention. Right? He's, he's, he's saying some shocking things, wanting you to look up and go, wait, wait a second, is that true? Look specifically at verses 1, 2, and 3. A good name is better than ointment. Listen, the day of death is better than the day of birth. Right, you're supposed to ask the question, do we, do we believe this, that the day of death would be better than the day of birth? That seems counterintuitive and just clearly wrong. It's better to go to the house of mourning, right, to a funeral, than to a house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. Do we believe that it's better to be sad than happy? Do we believe it's better to go to a funeral than to a feast? Do we believe the day of death is better than the day of life? This feels wrong. It feels counterintuitive. Um, it maybe it even feels a little bit offensive. And yet he is poetically bringing us to, to ask the question, like, hey, you've got to consider your death. You need, you need to think about this. Is this true? We already know that he's not discounting joy and good things. Right, we've, we've seen in chapter 3, right, there's a season for joy, right, a season of gladness, a season of laughter. There's also seasons of difficulty. That he's told us that there are good things as we eat and drink with friends and with family before the Lord. He is not discounting joy. What he's doing is he is heightening our attention and he's saying there is something about death that brings clarification. It brings clarity and it brings focus and it brings insight. If you think about the birth of a child, obviously that is a joyful, glorious moment. But that child in its birth, it's, at that point, it's, it's a it's potential. What might be? What could be? On the day of death, there is clarity. There is a revealing of what was. Not what might be, but what was. What was the life that we are celebrating or that we are mourning? It reveals. So funerals allow us to have the opportunity to be thoughtful, to consider our own life. And if we're honest, we don't necessarily enjoy that. And so if you watch many TV shows or movies, typically the scene after the funeral is uh, happening in a bar, right? Where, where people are, are laughing and they're joking and they're drinking and they're trying really quick to get away from the deep thoughts of life. But what he's saying here is, listen, we know that death at least temporarily, right, makes us focus in and have clarity and go, hey, what was that life for that person like? What would, what, what would they say about me? If that's my funeral and my death, what would they say about me and my life? It brings insight and it makes us consider. Listen to verses 4 through 6. So the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. You see, the heart of the wise remains there and is thoughtful and considerate for a little bit and, and asks questions that would then impact the way they're going to live. But the heart of the fool is in the house of mirth. The, the fool is the one that goes, I don't, this is really uncomfortable, and I don't enjoy this, and I don't like this, so I'm just going to, I'm going to use humor to break the mood, and I'm going to go do anything other than to really consider and ponder my life. better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. Saying, listen, there may be a time at a funeral or a death where someone comes up to you and says, hey, that person, that, that shameful thing in them, or that good thing in them, right, you're leading, you're living in a way that's going to give you some things said about you or thought about you, your death is not going to be pleasant because you're not living in an honoring way or you're living this way. Right, that rebuke from a wise person Right, it's actually good for you. It's good for your soul because you still have life left to live. But it says the fool doesn't want to consider these things and instead wants to go hear the song of fools. He's not 
critiquing music here. He's simply saying that you're looking to distract yourself. Make sure that you don't wrestle with the reality of life. Verse 6. For the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Um, apparently, when, when they would have a fire with, with thorns, thistles, the fire would be quick, it would be hot, it would pop, it would make a lot of noise. But it doesn't actually produce long-lasting heat. So it says, listen, the, the, the music, the talk of fools after death, right? It's loud, it's distracting, it puts off some heat, it immediately kind of does what you think it should do, but it's of no lasting impact. It doesn't actually bring help or healing or encouragement or hope or consideration. Listen, funerals are difficult, right? There's convoluted emotions. As we mourn, as we grieve, there's sometimes there's just a celebration of a, a life well lived. Um, sometimes it's just relief that someone's not suffering anymore, and so you're both sad that they're gone, and yet there's a legitimate relief that they're not hurting. Um, then there's the celebration of a life, or there could be mourning over broken things that were never fixed. Then there's that that tinge, that twinge in there for us that we know enough not to say, but you're thinking in a funeral, I'm just glad it wasn't me. I'm just glad it's not me. And like all these things kind of get muddled in a pot, and, and we just live in a culture that tends to kind of want to whitewash and sanitize death away. That we don't consider it, we don't wrestle with it, we don't think about it. I was laying in bed last night, even before going to sleep, thinking about the sermon and, and trying to think about my own mortality. And it's hard. Like, it, it's hard to let yourself go there. Um, my job necessitates that I'm around that. And yet, I can easily sometimes just go, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's them, it's not me. So even in the last couple of weeks, um, as I have walked as a healthy man into a hospital, um, right, with, with vigor and, and knowing that I'm going to walk out in a little bit, um, I feel like the Spirit has been reminding me there will be a day where you're not the one visiting people. That you'll be being visited. Like that's, that's, I, I, can, I can ignore that if I'm not careful. Standing there and watching someone die in front of me and going, there will be a day where that could be my body and my children are surrounding my bed. Right, like, and, and you're going, oh, no, no, like, let's make a joke of, Jeremy, don't go there, why are you thinking like that? And it's like, but it's, that's what Ecclesiastes is calling us to. Are we able for any length of time to go to the point that's going to inevitably happen? That our death will come. Not just others, not just those that you love, that your death will come. And so Psalm 116, 15 says, precious Right? Is the, it, 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 in the eyes of the Lord is the death of a saint. So the passage we preached at Miss Elaine's funeral. Psalm 90, 12 tells us, teach us how to number our days. Right? Like, like, let us know that our days have an end to them. And that these things make us very uncomfortable. But even verse 8, better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Are right, you saying, like you, all of us have talked about things we want to do or things that we want to start, and you do it with, um, with joy and enthusiasm and all the things that are going to happen. But he says at the end of a thing, you're able to say, what actually got accomplished? Like what actually was done? So the beginning of a marriage is full of hope. At the end of a marriage, at the end of 40, 50, 60 years, you're able to say, so look at what was accomplished. Look at kids and grandkids. Look at faithfulness to one another. Look at the circumstances that we maneuver through. The end is better than the beginning. And he's not saying the beginning's not good. It's just, the, it's just that the end is a revealer. And I know that even now our hearts, our, our minds are fighting, wanting you to go in your head, okay, we're not listening to the sermon. We're going to go somewhere else mentally until this is over. But Ecclesiastes is calling us to sit in this, to, to ponder this. Calling us to live with the right perspective of our, our mortality, that there will be a day when we will stand before God, and this life, as permanent as it feels, will be no more. It, it's calling us to dependence. 
not to mindless distraction. He's not saying it's better to be sad. What he's saying is it's better to engage the sadness. It's better to engage the lament and to grow and to learn and to be transformed by it, how to best live the life we have. Listen, we live in a strange time right now where COVID has kind of forced us collectively to attempt to do this. And yet what you've seen is, is folks are on one hand are attempting to do this. Listen, it doesn't matter where you stand on all the different aspects of COVID. It's kind of forced a cultural moment. But we've also seen the rise of just mindless distraction. Saying, hey, let's let's just let's not go there. Let's not consider that. Let's not think about that. Let's not deal with that. Ecclesiastes is just telling us, embrace your limits. Embrace the fact that you're going to die. Embrace the fact that not everything in life is going to make sense and that you're not in control. Look at verse 13. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Right? He's saying not everything in life makes sense. Like there are going to be things that you're going to see that are going to happen. That you're like, God, why that? Why did that person die at such a young age? Why did that person get this horrific sickness and suffer for a long time? Why did that country have an earthquake and all these things were destroyed? Why didn't those people, right? Like that we see horror and, and difficulty and trouble and, and travail and we ask the questions of like it doesn't make sense we scratch our head and it feels futile and so he even gives us an example of this futility look down in verse 15 in my vain life I've seen everything there's a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing most of you can put names in there Right, like specific people come to your mind of wicked people who have prospered and prolonged their life. And you're going, hey God, do you not see what's happening? And others of you can think of righteous people who were taken far too soon or even in their righteousness. I think he's given us that example. And so then, listen, the author of Ecclesiastes is a cynic here. Look at how he continues in verse 16. These are like kind of rambling thoughts. Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked. Don't be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It's good that you should, you should take hold of this and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. He's basically saying, listen, I don't know foolishness. It can end your life soon. Wisdom apparently can end your life soon. You can be wicked and die uh, after a long life. You can be righteous. He's like... I don't know what to do. Like you can almost just see this like cynical throwing up his hands of like life doesn't make sense. And it's difficult. And yet what he's doing here is he's calling us to live in light of the fact that death is coming for you. And he's just admitting we're not going to be able to understand all the nooks and crannies and nuances of life. So then what do we do? How do we live? He's just going to begin to show some of the limits that we see. Let's walk through a couple of these real quick. Look at verse 7. Um, Surely oppression drives the, the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. He just reminds us, wisdom is not foolproof. Right? We talked about money last week. That money can take a wise person and make them do stuff they wouldn't have done. Right? That, that wisdom has um, an end when it's found in us and not in God. And it's not foolproof that just that someone appears wise doesn't mean that they can't walk a crooked path. Verse 10. Stay not. Why were the former days better than these? He's saying, listen, if you're always being nostalgic and saying, hey, it was a better then. He's like, one, you forgot the history because it wasn't. Two, you're, you're saying, I don't believe that God's in control. Because if God's in control of these days, then he has you here for a reason and a purpose, and he's good because if he was in control then, he's in control now. And, and just the honest fact that it is typically emotion that is not based in reality. The first time I remember experiencing this 
right? Was um, had a good freshman year of college, enjoyed the campus, right? There's just this kind of sense about it. And then later on that summer, I had to go back onto my college campus for the first time. And I'm, I'm excited to be there, expecting the same that kind of energy and, and aura. And, and there was no one there. And I was like, oh, this is just a place. Right? Like my nostalgia was not that it, I remembered wrong. It's just that it wasn't remembering everything. Right? I can't recreate that. And so many of you have gone back and tried to recreate a date or recreate an experience or recreate a moment. And you find that you can't. Right? Because there's something about living in that moment that made it sweet. And so celebrate the good memories. Like look back with gratitude. But let's not say that those days were better than these days. Because it's claiming that God's not good. And that he's not in control. And that he's not at work and doing something among us now. So there's a, there's a limit to wisdom in verse 7. There's a limit to nostalgia in verse 10. Go to verse uh, 23. All these have been tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise. Like there's a pursuit here of knowledge and of wisdom, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? Basically saying, there's a limit to plumbing the depths of knowledge and understanding. That you can spend your life pursuing it and you won't find it all. You will not scrape the bottom. And so he just has this realization of, I actually have a lot of wisdom. And I can't figure out why. I can't make all the pieces work. I can't make all the understanding happen. And he's coming to that realization. Verse 26. Not only is there a limit to wisdom, there's a limit to pleasure. So verse, I'll start at 25. I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom in the scheme of things. And to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. Verse 26. And I found something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He, pleases, he who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Basically talking about a woman, right, who uses her, her feminine wiles, right, to bring in men to their destruction. He's not saying that all women do this. He's saying there's a type of woman. And this is who she is. He's also saying there's a type of man who's attracted to. And in that relationship, it is transactional. It is not devoted. It is not caring. It is not compassionate. It is not love. It is a mutual using of one another. And it is destruction. So he says, even if we seek pleasure, there is a way that pleasure can destroy us. There is a limit to that as well. So he continues in this in verse 27. So he says, I'm, I'm just going to seek like morality, right, like of, of, of goodness. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher. While adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things which my soul has sought repeatedly, and I haven't found it. One man among a thousand I have found, but a woman among all these I have not found. He basically said, man, I searched for a thousand dudes and found one good dude. And I searched a thousand women, I didn't find any of them. Right? And you're going, whoa now. Right? Like, he, he is speaking in hyperbole. He said, as we seek value, as we seek morality, and he's saying, like, it, it's just, it's not there. Because this is very likely Solomon who's writing this. If you go to 1 Kings 11, you, can, you may begin to get a little bit of insight into the number of thousand and why he said no women. This is verse 3. Um, sorry, let me start in verse 2. You shall not, the Lord said to Solomon, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon, though, clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. If your math is good, there's a thousand. And his wives turned away his heart. And when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. When he says, I searched among a thousand women, and I found none, he maybe was actually speaking quite literally. He wasn't speaking about the female race, right? The female, like, women in general. He was saying, like, I've looked in my kingdom, 
and there aren't, there aren't good women. But it's because of his own sin and his own wickedness that he is living out, right, verses uh, 25, or 25 and 26, that he has sought to use women for his pleasure and good and found there's a limit to them, and he's found that those women were glad to return the favor. That there's a limit to these things. Verse 20 continues to give us insight into what's happening here. Surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And then he gives you an example. He's like, ah, hey, I'm not so bad. Like, maybe I'm not completely righteous. Look at verse 21. So don't take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times yourself have cursed others. So he's like, listen, if you think too highly of yourself, if you listen long enough, you're going to find that other people don't think that highly of you. And as soon as you get offended and want to be upset about it and rail about why they're wrong, remind yourself how many times you've done the same. He, he's revealing our heart. And say, there's a limit to our ability to be good, to be moral, to be righteous. There's a limit to wisdom. There's a limit to pleasure. There's a limit to, to, to the pursuit of these things. And so ultimately, he is talking about death and then telling us we're not very good. And so chapter 7 is like a real page turner, right? Like you're like, hey, give me some more. Like this, it feels daunting. It feels difficult. It feels depressing. It feels futile, desperate. But look at verse 14. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. He says, that's easy. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. The call then is this. He's like, you celebrate the good and the bad. You accept it, that you're not in control. You take it, and you, when things are good, and you enjoy it, and you celebrate it. And when things are bad, you remind yourself, it's all something God. And that he's doing something. That he's at work in your midst. That this life, we can consider the work of God and who can make straight what he has made crooked. He is peeling our fingers off of believing that we're in control. And he's calling us to trust and depend that he is. Things actually are not as futile as we believe them to be. Look at verse 29. See, this alone I have found, that God made man and woman upright, but they have sought out many schemes. He has taken us back to Genesis 1 through 3. He's saying God created us to walk with him, to know him, to enjoy him, to love him, to be with him forever. And it was through our sin and our rebellion that futility has entered the world, where, where straight things have been made crooked, and where things don't make sense, and relationships are broken, where man would use a woman for sex and a woman to do the same, where wisdom can't be sought out because we've rebelled against God. All of these things are taking place. And he says, that's the world you're living in, not in the per perfected, created harmony that God gave us, but in the futility of this world and of this life. And then you throw death on the end, and you can become really overwhelmed. Because death is the great um, enemy, the great separator. But for those in Christ, we know that we were not created in futility. We know that futility doesn't get the final word. But we live in the midst of a world that's affected by it right now. And so we can agree with the author of Ecclesiastes that there are things that don't make sense. And there will be those who are taken far too early. There will be those that seem to um, prolong their life through wickedness. There will be those who deserve love who won't seem to receive it. There will be those who will have riches and abuse them. Right? All these things are going to occur. And so we can either rail against God and claim that we're in control and be frustrated. Or we can let our hands loose and trust that God is good, that he is in control, and that he is doing things. That there is wisdom that our depths cannot even begin to find. And what he is doing in this life, in this world. We can begin to see that it was the death of Jesus that killed death. 
so we don't mourn as those without hope. And so Psalm 116, 15 and Psalm 90, 12 can be true. That we can begin to live in light of the day where you will stand before and meet God. And so now we can begin to navigate this world with that end in mind. As we lift our chins and look to that. And he came for the sick. And Ecclesiastes 7 tells us you're sick. We're all sick. We're all in need. And yet the good news is he came for the sick. To rescue. It says the sick need a doctor. The well don't. The well in this case are fools. And if we don't consider our day of death, if we don't lift our chin and look at the trajectory that ends there, then we are deluding ourselves and we are fools. If we say we don't need a doctor, that we don't need a rescuer, because he's defeated our enemies. And live the life that we were meant to and that we could not navigate in this futility. And then his one today is alive. And so you have access to him. And you're not alone. And you haven't been forsaken. And so when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, so we don't lose, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Church, you can breathe. You don't have to be in control. You have not been asked to be in control. We have been placed right in, in this futile world. And it's like he opens your eyes to see the things that are not seen. And so if you, if you ever walk through a dark place that you know well, right? Other people are bumping into everything. But you know the place well enough, you can kind of navigate in the dark. It's what this life looks like for the Christian. We're still living in the midst of the futile world. But we see it differently. Because we're looking at a different finish line. A different hope. And those things aren't seen, but they will be found to be eternal and hopeful and good for us. Or we can continue to chase the vapor and the smoke that we can't grasp, but we can see it. So Ecclesiastes 7 is saying, please don't be a fool. Please consider, please live in light of these things. So you can enjoy today. If this is a good day, if this has been a good week, you can enjoy it. But there's better coming. And if this week has been hard, if this season has been hard, if you're not having a good season, a good day, it doesn't get the final say. Jesus does. He does. So we began this morning with the idea of parenting. And we have to parent with intentionality. The only way that happens is if we're looking to the day our kids leave. Right? That's how we parent with intentionality. Ecclesiastes is saying, okay, if you want to live wisely, you want to live intentionally, then you have to look to the day that your life ends. And if you get that sorted, if you know that that day will happen, then it will affect the way that you live up until that day. It will change the way you think about it, because you won't be a fool putting it off and considering that it won't happen, but you live knowing that day will come. And for some of us, it will come sooner than it should. For some, it's going to be a long time. But it's coming. And what, how will we meet the Lord that day? Will it be with our righteousness saying, I did a pretty good job in that futile world and I have some questions for you. Or will we be saying, thank you for Jesus. He's my only hope. He's sufficient for me. He never left me and he never forsook me. Here's our hope. I'm going to read one final passage. Isaiah 25, beginning in verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord will wipe
wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. There will be a day when it will not be better to be in the house of mourning, but it will be at the feast because Jesus is one. He has given us insight into this life until this is true. And so we can live in light of whatever circumstances come our way because this is our hope. This is our future because he is our God. And if you don't know him in this way, if you are still chasing vapor and he is calling to you, come and trust me. Come and know me. Fear death no longer. Father, there is a, a desire in our hearts um, to laugh, to segue, to joke, to, to move out of sitting in difficulty or in, in sitting and pondering. God, everything in us um, is going to quickly want to run to that. God, would you give us space today um, in the week to come? where you would just remind us of Ecclesiastes 7 and, and, and give us some space. Will we fight for that space to sit, to question, to ask, to let you direct our thoughts and our hearts? God, would we not be fools who just quickly run past this? Lord, would we let Ecclesiastes be as though it was a funeral of a close person to us this week? God, would we not be afraid of the silence? Because we know that you'll meet us. That we have access to you. That you see us and that you know us and that you love us and that you... God, that you're enough. Would we not be afraid to find that to be true? So Lord, for those this morning that are chasing vapor, God, would you let them see that it's vapor? For those of us who fear death, Lord, would you allow us to be rooted in you? God, for those of us who um, would be so presumptuous as just to think it doesn't affect us, God, that we would repent of our arrogance and be glad to be dependent upon you because you're in control and you're good and you can trust you. But we need you. We ask you to, to work in our hearts and our minds as we sing, as we pray, as we consider, and as we ponder. Lord, would you do the work that your word does that would not return void? Have um, a scalpel's precision. You cut out what needs to go, to reveal what needs to stay, to root us and to anchor us. In Jesus' name, amen. Standards that bring us this morning, let's respond together to the Lord.